because humans were able to see visible light, and it's probably not too surprising that the very first form of electromagnetic radiation discovered after light would be something close to light. And in fact, it's infrared. I just want to point out that there is this R in here. I often see people spelling infrared just as I-N-F-A-R-E-D, but it's infrared. And it's perfectly fine, just put IR for infrared, as it is uh, commonly referred to as. The discoverer of infrared radiation was Sir William Herschel. Yes, his first name here, but he was better known and went by William Herschel. With the Sir, you know that he is indeed from the United Kingdom. And the way that he discovered infrared radiation was through taking light and having it diffract and passing this light so that it would diffract, spread out, and also refract through a prism. And so you get the color spectrum. And he had thermometers placed in various regions around the color spectrum and discovered that the thermometers displayed different temperatures. And that evidence led to the claim that there has to be some sort of vibrations that are existing that you can't see directly with your human eye, just as Maxwell had predicted. Some of you may have actually done the Herschel experiment when you were in younger grades. Classically done with a cardboard box. The prism is up here. The sunlight is diffracted and refracted. You get this color spectrum. And putting your thermometers along here, you can also put them on the other side, but thermometers here to reveal that you do have different temperatures as you go beyond the color spectrum. Now some of these applications are certainly those that give infrared its nickname. It's often called heat radiation. You could certainly make an argument all of these could be referred to as heat radiation. Obviously we know microwave ovens take the microwaves and allow us to heat the food. Infrared tends to get the nickname of heat radiation more because as humans we can perceive the infrared radiation through heat. For example, these heat lamps, they are infrared bulbs. Now the red up here is not the infrared that you're seeing. These don't have to be red. They tend to be red for safety reasons so that we can get a little bit of energy passing through this red kind of a filter effect so that we can tell that there is energy being transmitted from the bulb or being emitted from the bulb. And so this is a safety feature. You would not be able to see directly the infrared radiation that this bulb would be emitting. And that could be quite dangerous. You put your hand under there for a few seconds and uh, before your skin starts to kind of register the heat and the warmth, uh, you may result in a bit of a burn the next day. So why do we have heat lamps? Well, sometimes in the fast food industry, it is correct when they say made fresh for you daily. It just may not necessarily mean at the exact moment you pulled up to the drive through The production line, you have to have lots of your uh, go-to menu items ready to plop into those uh, brown sacks and be handed out the window at a quick pace. So we got to warm those up. Also, as humans, we like to take creatures out of their natural habitat and put them in boxes, and uh, we need to keep them warm as they are used to warm climates. Miss Heilbutt is one such human who could show you awesomely cute photos of a creature that she has raised since it was about the size of a Taco Bell hot sauce packet but we want to care for these creatures and we want to keep them warm. And so this uh, is a form that we can do that readily. Researchers found that treatment with near infrared light can prevent the development of a disease that causes blindness in children born prematurely. That's a wonderful application of infrared. Now this near infrared, just to point out that infrared radiation does have some subcategories, far, mid, near. You don't need to memorize those. You just need to be aware of infrared's place within the AMP spectrum. For example, infrared has longer wavelengths, lower frequencies than light, and of course some applications, like we were mentioning this one, how can prevent development of diseases which cause blindness. 
Another application is the ability to find veins in premature babies' hands. The red glow you're seeing isn't really the infrared that you're seeing. It's more of a mechanism to make us aware the machine is on. If it's a battery-operated machine, we know the batteries are in good working order. We're also working on using this similar technology to find veins for individuals who have to frequently provide themselves with injections, for example, maybe diabetics. Here is definitely one of my favorite applications of infrared radiation, and that would be remote controls. Certainly, remote controls can also function in a radio wave, but uh, infrared, probably more common for daily use. How can you tell the difference if your remote operates on infrared or radio waves? Usually it's an infrared remote control if you have to have direct line of sight with your remote and the television, stereo system, Wii that you are trying to control. Radio waves don't necessarily have to have that direct line of sight for remote control operation. The infrared radiation, you often have red buttons on remote controls, and again, that is just to let you know that the battery is working. You know, the time when you think, if I just press the button harder, I don't need to change the batteries, or if I stand up and put a better direct line of sight to my uh, receiver, then I don't have to change the batteries. So you're not seeing infrared when you see the red bulb here, you're seeing the red within the visible light spectrum to let you know about the status of your battery. We can use different instruments to see indirectly the radiations beyond light. This is using a digital camera to look at an Xbox, I think, controller. And this right here is the infrared radiation that is being emitted. My dad said people used to have to get up to change the channel. So the remote didn't work unless you were standing up? I guess not. Sadly, this is my childhood. I remember being the remote control. The time I was growing up, there were only three TV channels you could choose from. BBC One, BBC Two, or ITV. And it would just so happen you'd finally turn the dial, yes, a dial, You'd sit on the couch to watch whatever your parental unit said, let's watch that. You'd start to get comfortable, then all of a sudden they'd say, oh, that needs to be louder. So then you have to walk back over to the TV, turn the volume dial. Finally, I decided I'm just going to park myself next to the television. The kids today are spoiled. When I was young, I had to walk to the TV to change channels. And then there was the walk back. In snow, uphill, both ways. I'm now going to show you a clip from the History Channel's Lost and Found and it's going to walk you through the evolution of the television remote control. One of the things I want you to pay particular attention to is the different ways that we have used mechanical and electromagnetic radiation as means to change channels, to turn the volume up or down. So pay attention which form of radiation is being used, whether it's mechanical or electromagnetic, and within the electromagnetic spectrum, think about the different uses of the radiation forms for the remote control. Television commercials. They are roadblocks to our collective viewing pleasure. And there have been too many of them since the very beginning. So, in 1954, one television engineer took matters into his own hands. His solution? A handheld pistol to shoot his television. Today we call his gun the remote control. The 1950s. It was the golden age of TV. But the founder of Zenith Electronics was fed up. Eugene McDonald has spent the better part of his career developing radio and television technology. And what did the airwaves come to? Commercials. Annoying, talk-filled commercials that interrupted his favorite programs. He knew one thing, though. Commercials couldn't possibly last. TV viewers wouldn't stand for them. Advertising, McDonald figured, would eventually be replaced by paid television subscriptions. In the meantime, he believed anything he could do to help end TV advertising would be a blessing to television viewers everywhere. Viewers, it seemed, were victims of the networks. 
In those days, there were basically only three channels to choose from. When television came into the homes in the 1950s, people were really excited. Obviously, it became the focal point of the living room. And you would sit down and select maybe the one network that you wanted to watch that night. And you'd sit down in your easy chair and you would really have a relationship. In 1951, Zenith tried selling a small handheld device they called Lazy Bones. It featured buttons that enabled you to sit in your chair and change the channel up or down without getting up. Technically, it was the first remote control. But it wasn't quite remote enough. Lazy Bones had a cord. People were unhappy about the cable. For various reasons, you stumbled over it, it didn't look very nice on the living room floor. You had to roll it up every time guests came and so on. So there was a great desire for a wireless remote control. Help was on the way. In 1954, McDonald forever changed the way the rest of us view life. He laid down a challenge to engineers at Zenith. Develop a wireless remote that could turn commercials off when they interrupted the program and that turned the show back on when it reappeared. Employee Gene Polly met the challenge just as McDonald was putting a new TV in his own home. McDonald said he wanted an old Lazy Bones remote control for his new set, but Polly had a better idea. And I said to myself, let's give him something special. So we went ahead and we made a unit up with photo cells on the bottom that uh, muted the volume and turned the, the channel and uh, turned the set on. And we had it put up in his house. And, and we, we relaxed, you know, like fat and happy until about a month later we got a call. Put it in production. McDonald loved his wireless remote and he thought America would love it too. And so, after a little tweaking, salvation from commercials came in the form of a gun. A green ray gun. It was called the Flashmatic. The Flashmatic was essentially a flashlight in the shape of a pistol. As a company press release explained, the magic ray was harmless to humans. The device had no dangling wires or connecting cords, and to silence commercials, all viewers had to do was point and click. Good aim was also a plus. All four corners of the TV were light sensitive. When the magic ray hit one corner, the channel changed up. Another corner turned the channel down. The set on and off was up in this corner. This was the mute. And the mute was the most popular feature. If, for good reason. In many places where this was sold, they only had one TV station. You didn't need the channel changing. But like the lazy bones before it, the Flashmatic had problems too. Occasionally, uh, the sun would be sinking in the west and the TV sets uh, sitting on the east side of the room would get the full sunlight and the tuna would go crazy. But Zenith was on to something. Engineers set to work on a new and improved remote the same year. Dr. Robert Adler at Zenith pioneered the use of ultrasonics, a high-frequency sound beyond the range of human hearing. One sound turned the set on, one triggered the channel down, one moved it up, and one, of course, was to mute. Zenith dubbed its newest remote control Space Command. It's the new Zenith Space Command TV tuning control box. Look, no wires, no cords, no batteries, no flashlights. Space Command's ultrasonics set the standard for remotes for 25 years. Then, in the 1980s, an infrared beam replaced sound as the key technology. Of course, the concept today is still the same as when folks change the channel with a little green gun. We just don't pull a trigger. An original Flashmatic and Space Command remote control are in the archives of the Zenith Electronics Corporation in Glenview. Another application of infrared radiation are thermal images or thermographs. We have the same building in the top and bottom photographs taken at the same time of day. Just happens to be this image is taken through an optical camera, so through our visible light range. And this is taken through an infrared camera. It's not that the building is on fire. You actually have an overcast situation here, so you have some internal reflection going on with the heat from the sun. Similarly, the building isn't on fire. This is the heat within the building that you can actually see that's been generated. 
here, we can see the optical image versus the infrared image, and we can see an effect known as shielding, where this black plastic bag is shielding from our vision this, what we infer to be an arm. The infrared radiation can penetrate through this, where visible light doesn't, and it's not reflected back to our eye to see what's beyond or underneath that plastic sheeting, and the infrared allows us to confirm it is, of course, the gentleman's arm. If you see here, his glasses actually act as a shielding for the infrared radiation. That infrared has a very difficult time passing through glass. So one of the reasons when in the prime of summer, you leave your car, do some shopping, return to your vehicle, and you feel like you're stepping inside a fully cooked baked potato. The infrared radiation from the sun is able to transmit partially through the windows of the glass. And what is happening is over time that heat is building up because it's trying to reflect off the different surfaces, but it's not able to transmit as well uh, through the glass. And it's just a matter of the buildup of the small amounts of radiation that continue to reflect within your vehicle. Here's a thermogram that's used to check the electrical safety of power plants and junctions. Here's a conduit where the brighter the color, the hotter it is. Without this infrared image, it would just look dark, blackish in color as uh, you move around the warehouse. But this right here allows you to actually see this bright spot where this re uh, relay needs to be changed. Sometimes it's very ineffective cost-wise to open up the silos and see what is inside, or not necessarily what's inside, but more so uh, how full the silos are. So the infrared imaging allows us to do a quick check. Unless the material is less dense and floating, I would say this is the silo that has more material in it than this container right here. And sometimes it's just not practical to open up these silos to look at the levels as you might not want to have the gases from the atmosphere, nitrogen, oxygen, getting into these containers. Here we can see the very classic world of friction. We can see the heat that is built up on tires as they are in contact with the road surface. Smaller tires, but still able to see last point of contact of this bicycle wheel on the ground and friction trail here. Remember, the brighter the colors, the hotter, more warmth you're seeing. This is a car that's actually been parked at, uh, and with the engine off for about 15 minutes. So the 35% inefficiency energy of vehicles is demonstrated here with just how long it takes to cool down a vehicle. You're not likely to recognize what this thing is here. Uh, the common guesses by students is a toaster, Texas slice toaster with, but this is actually a cell phone battery charger. Yes, my friends, we used to separate the battery component from the mobile device itself, have to plop it into this charger for a couple hours, and while your battery was not connected to your phone, obviously it wouldn't work. So we'd wait hours in between reuse of our mobile devices. Laptops were not actually designed to sit on your laptop. They were more about convenience that you could carry your work with you and work on your work through your computer means. And this is why you definitely don't want to sit it on your laptop. It can get very, very warm. Any takers on what we see here? It's a hair blow dryer. Many people who use blow dryers tend to think if I just stick my head right here and have the hair dryer right up close to my skull, my hair will dry faster. Actually, if you incorporate physics Bernoulli's principle here, you can see you're getting a wider area of heat farther away from the hair dryer. So give it a try. Stick your hair or your head, your hair attached to your head, uh, farther out from the hairdryer. See if you get faster, more positive results that way. Yes, styling tips from me in physics. This is the hot water 
coming out of a shower head. Makes you think, do you prefer cold showers or warm, hot or scalding, where you get a new epidermal layer every shower? Companies that deal with things like home insulation are going to make use of an infrared camera to be able to show customers just where in their homes the cold is coming in or escaping the heat. In a kitchen, we have a hot water pipe. So this pipe is actually underneath the kitchen tiles here. And this certainly would be something a homeowner would want to insulate. Can you tell what that image is? You do have a door here. You're looking at the hot water pipe in a kitchen. So it's actually underneath these tiles and the homeowner certainly would want to insulate that pipe. Crock pot, oven range, that's that larger rectangle in most people's kitchens that allows you to cook food. This happens to be a gas burner. This is a convection toaster or convection oven. So using the cycle of warm air rising, cool air coming in underneath to heat food. This is not an ancient Egyptian pyramid. This is a modern pyramid in Las Vegas. The trees are very bright, very warm compared to uh, things like the building. The trees are a life form, but the, the reason they're showing up so hot is because we light everything up in Vegas. So not only the sidewalk being lit down here, but lights shining directly onto these trees. A little blotch that's moving up along here, that's actually one of the many elevators in the Hotel Pyramid Luxor. This stripe right here is one particular floor level, and it's not the high stakes gambling. The gambling in casinos always is in the base level of these hotels. This happens to be the HVAC level, so your heating and air conditioning units, all that machinery that's required to keep the building warm or cool. At the very top, the apex of the pyramid, that's brighter than the rest of the bit or more areas of the building than not, because the pyramid emits an enormous beam of light at night. And the Luxor by day. Here we have an airplane that has fairly recently taken off and we can tell because the heat generated from those wheels being pulled up into the underbelly of the fuselage. Here are two planes coming out of Salt Lake uh, Airport. The folks are coming out of the Salt Lake International Airport. Let's call this plane on the left, left plane. We'll call this plane on the right, the right plane. Ask yourself which plane, lefty or righty, has been sitting on the ground for a longer period of time. Hopefully you chose the righty plane, as lefty is much warmer, and the right plane has definitely had more time to cool down. Fireworks through an infrared image. What do we have there? You can see a source of heat here. Very cold along here. Because what you have is a cold-blooded animal. You have a snake consuming a rat. Over on the left is just a screen covering the actual visible range photo. Over here Students commonly guess that you have flowers, but what you actually have is a litter of bunnies. Clothing is being developed where it can act as a shielding. So here you can see the lower temperature, same human, with a regular type of fabric. This is a special fabric that is purposely designed to try and shield infrared radiation. And why might we want to hide individuals from infrared cameras, infrared imaging? Well, because of the ability we now have to create devices that allow us to perceive the different radiation levels, like night vision goggles. So night vision goggles are green because the human eye can differentiate more shades of green than any other color. 
And we'll leave you with an infrared photograph of a garden.